I, I gave a brief overview of your, of your history a little bit just now. Um, I think I left off there that you started off as an angel investor originally. Uh, and so question for you is, you, you know, you did quite well. Do you have any overall words of wisdom for in, any angel investors out there in the crowd or watching on, online uh, about, uh, you know, what to do, what not to do? So I found the transition. So after I, 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 I was doing angel investing for about five years before we started First Round Capital. And I found the transition to be very challenging um, from going from an operator entrepreneur to an angel investor because one of the, the, one of the ways I lost a lot of money in angel investing um, was I would meet with an entrepreneur and they would lay out their vision. And in my mind, I'd be deconstructing it to the raw materials, to like the ingredients. Um, and then I would sort of look at those ingredients and say, wow, I could bake this with those ingredients. So it was as if they were saying, I want to make brownies. And here's, you know, and I would instantly say, oh, there's chocolate, there's flour, there's milk, there's sugar, there's cream, you know. And I would say, that would be a kick-ass chocolate souffle. And the idea that you had. The idea, you know, I would kind of say, imagine like if I was running this, this is what I would do differently. And I'd, you know, to, to break the metaphor, I'd fund the souffle, and the entrepreneur thought I was funding the brownies. And you know, you just had you just started off at a very different spot. So it's become, you know, it, it's hard because you have these entrepreneurial instincts, but you really have to recognize that you're not the cook, that the entrepreneur is the cook. And that while you might be able to offer some advice or some, some, some value add based on your experiences, you really have to understand what the entrepreneur wants to cook. Um, and, and that's taken a really long time because, and, and it's hard because, but, but when a company's starting out and it's, it's like a missile on the launch pad, a one or two degree shift on the launch pad could result in like being miles apart when it hits its destination. Um, and, and, and even a subtle difference of, 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 of alignment um, is tough. So you'd want to make sure, I, what I've learned I, I, at least, is that it's really important to make sure that there's alignment on the launch pad. How, how do you do that? Any, any tips? I, I think it's just spending time with the entrepreneur. I didn't realize how much the outcome, everyone talks about we back grade entrepreneurs, but in the early days I thought I, I gave way too much emphasis to the idea or to the market. And the idea always changes and the market always changes, but the entrepreneur doesn't. Um, so it's just understanding. And, and, and I think it's also, this is where it gets a little bit of an art. When entrepreneurs want your money, they kind of uh-huh you a lot. And, and you have to decide like, okay, is there really shared agreement on this alignment on the vision? Because I don't want to back something that the entrepreneur doesn't believe in. It's not my job to try to change their, you know, you know they're driving the bus. They should be driving it. Sure. Um, and, and they shouldn't want me rooting for a different you know, vision. So I think there really just needs to be alignment. But I recognize how much I think I, 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 I thought that an angel investor initially, um, the role was, to, was, a, was a little more activist than I think it is today. So speak, like maybe as a, as a transition to another question, uh, you're, you're therefore, like because of what you've done with first round, you're in a unique vantage point, having, having seen both angel investing as an investor and VC investing as, an, as a VC investor. What are, what are some notable contrasts and differences, and how do you see the two respective groups of cap, types of capital playing together? So, so we're in and, a little and, and different sort of position. In the, in the context of what, you know, what individual investors should be thinking about, too. We're in a little different position because we're a seed stage firm, right? We're called first round because we invest in the first round. So we're typically co-investing with angels. So in terms of alignment, we're not coming in in the, you know, we're not typically following on in that A or B, uh, sorry, we're not typically making initial investments in the A or B round. Our initial investments are, are almost always in the seed round alongside angels. So I think we're pretty aligned with angels. Um, and I've seen angels deliver an incredible amount of value add. Over the last five years, I think I have seen a shift in sort of angels. It used to be that, an, that the typical angel investor would actually spend a fair amount of time and a fair amount of money. I think now you're seeing far more money than time being contributed to the company. Um, 
which is diminishing to some degree. You know, you talk to some, of, some founders who started companies in 2004, 2006, um, and, and you look at what some of those angels did, what, whether it's an Ariel Poehler, who I think is a, you know, is a very unique angel, Brett Bullington and, and his engagement at Oodle. You look at what some of these angels did, and it's really sort of playing, you know, marrying mentorship and advice with capital. And I think what you're seeing now a little bit is the unbundling of that. Is that, do you think that's a good thing, a bad thing? Uh, will, there be, will there be some sort of further evolution beyond that? It's a thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 as long as everyone's expectations are, are, are there, I think it's fine. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're just, you know, and I, look, I think, it's, I think it's a good thing. We've seen an incredible growth in the amount of seed stage capital available, which I think overall is a good thing. But you have to recognize the consequences of that. Um, we've seen in the last five years about a 3x increase in seed capital, according to our estimates. You haven't seen a 3x increase in terms of Series A, Series B, or follow-on capital. You've actually seen a slight decrease. So imagine, it, it, the analogy I would use is this. Imagine if you were the admissions director at Stanford. And every year for the past 10 years, you've gotten 10,000 applicants applying in the beginning of their junior year. Um, and you had 800 or 900 slots. But this year, for some crazy reason, you have 30,000 applicants, not 10,000. And they're applying at the beginning of their senior year, not their junior year. So you have more data to watch, you know, a key year of, formula, of, of growth to sort of watch them grow. And you still have 900 slots. That's kind of what's happening in the ecosystem today. Overall, I think it's a good thing. I think, uh, you know, because you're seeing more entrepreneurs get a chance, but it also means that the bar to get to that next round is meaningfully higher. Sure, we, uh, we talked about this earlier in the, in the discussion with Gary Tan uh, referencing, uh, of Y Combinator referencing how the bar has been raised essentially sort of B level, series B level expectations for series A rounds. Uh, but you just pointed out there's actually three times as much seed capital available as well. Do you think that's merely we're just shifting things around, providing more capital to earlier stage companies that lets them hit that higher bar? Or do you actually think there's an imbalance right now? And I think it's how a great does that time. affect investors' uh, decisions? Look, I, I, we've built a firm focused on seed stage, and we're going to stay there. But I would say I think it's a great time to be a Series A, Series B investor right now. You have a lot of people in this room that are taking some of that early risk um, that, are, that, are, that are fighting for that Series A dollar. And uh, so you, you recently first round announced something pretty interesting called the Dorm, dorm Room Fund. Uh, and maybe could you, could you share just briefly a little bit about it? And then I have a follow-up question. But. Sure. So I co-founded my first company in Fanatics when I was uh, after my sophomore year at uh, undergrad. So I started it in a dorm room. Um, and, but when you look back, there are entrepreneurs far more successful than myself who also started in a dorm room, whether it's Dell, whether it's Microsoft, whether it's Yahoo, whether it's Google, whether it's Facebook. Like, these are massive industry-changing companies that started in a dorm room. Now, we've, it's pretty common knowledge that the cost to start a company has come way down, right? My sure. first company in Phonautics, it took us $5 million to get the first product launch in 2003. We had to build a data center out of Halon suppression, fire control system, a diesel generator. Like, there was no such thing as, as, as a data center. Second company, um, Half.com in the late 90s, we can go to Exodus and we could rent a, rent, a, uh, rent a cage ourselves. And the third company, you could sort of post, you could just put things in a rack. And now you see companies that are, that are using the cloud. So the cost is coming way down. So you, what's interesting is it's, it, you're seeing this democratization of entrepreneurship. The, the barrier to start a company is coming way down. And that, that, that's going to have a profound impact on student entrepreneurs because now they're no longer at a major economic disadvantage compared to where, where student entrepreneurs might have been 10 years ago. For $10,000, they could get a product to market, an app to market. You, know, you could get something launched, um, or, which previously would have cost hundreds of thousands or millions. So, so the bet we believe is that you're going to see far more student entrepreneurs. So it's, uh, I don't know if people know this, but it's entirely... So we, yeah, so we, so we set up a fund. We, it was an experiment in Philly at Penn initially, where we said, we're going to invest half a million dollars in this dorm room fund to fund student entrepreneurs in the Philly region, you know, Drexel, Penn, Wharton, at 20,000 a pop. So we're going to fund 25 of these companies. But rather than us as VCs making the investment decision, who, 
Who knows the, the student marketplace better than anyone else? It's the students. So we announced that we're going to basically give this half a million dollar fund to a student investment committee. And we, accept, we, we said we're accepting applications and we just blogged about it and didn't know what we were gonna get. 700 students expressed interest, 400 went all the way through an application process, we chose 11 to invest it. To date, they've invested in over eight companies. They've just been live a year. It's been working so well that we launched Dorm Room Fund in San Francisco, at Stanford and UCAL. We launched it in New York, at Columbia and NYU, and just last week we launched it in Boston at Harvard and MIT. So now there's $2 million that is gonna fund 100 student-run startups over the next two years um, with very small checks, basically the get it, get it off the ground money so they could either pay for their hosting, pay for an external designer, um, that type of stuff, and get a, get a product built. So you, I, I think you pre-answered the question I was going to follow up that, uh, which is, why, you know, why did you choose to make it student run? But I, I, I'm hearing, and maybe you could answer that a little bit more. Yeah, well, I mean, I think if, if and is it wise, is it wise to sort to of give two million dollars to, to people that can't drink who've never, or perhaps have legally, never had, they may have never had a job before, for example, like uh, oh, they most of them haven't had jobs before, and it's a, it's a, it's a, you know. We, it's an experiment, and we know the outcome will be spectacular. We just don't know whether it'll be a spectacular success or a spectacular failure. Um, but if you believe that students are smart enough to found Facebook in college, or Microsoft in college, or Google, or Yahoo in college, why would you believe that students aren't smart enough to identify those companies while they're in college? Why, like, what is it about? You know, if you were to sit down, and if I, any time I've tried to find interns in college, and if I go there cold, I don't have the network. Sometimes you ask professors, and they have some insight, but if you ask the right students, if you ask the head of the entrepreneurial club, the head of the tech club, the head of, you know, of all these, you know, these clubs, sort of who's the hacker and who's the poser, they know. Um, like the students know. And so our belief was that the single best way to build a portfolio of student-based businesses was to trust the students. Now, we've retained veto, right? Just in case they come back and are funding something that's gonna land us in jail. But, but we haven't exercised it and hope we don't ever have to. Sure, that's uh, interesting. Also, I think you caught a glimpse of what I was referring to. My opening remarks, I, I commented how some of the best investors today are, are very humble and I mean, here, here you are talking about this new endeavor potentially being uh, not a spectacular success, but the opposite, potentially. I mean, it just oh. remains to be seen. I think that's, uh, that's we view our, interesting. We view first round as a startup, and we, therefore we launch a lot of minimum viable products, and some take off and some don't, but we're constantly iterating, trying to sort of, you know, that, that video you saw was an excerpt of a holiday video. Every year for the past five years, we've, you know, we just got started five years ago. I don't know if you all remember, there was that crazy, move, crazy YouTube viral sensation, like where in the world is Matt? This guy, Matt, danced in 42 different countries with locals of all those countries. So we kind of said, wouldn't it be just like a blast to do that at all 40 some out of our companies? Let's just dance with them. So we put it out and launched it as, our, as a holiday card instead of sending out those little boring, like the partners of First Round Capital wish you a joyous holiday season. We just put this video out there and it got 100,000 plus views. So like every year we've tried to sort of just figure out what the viral video of the year was. I think the following year, Susan Boyle on America got, on Britain's Got Talent started singing I Dream the Dream. Well, we got people that dream dreams. So we had them sing um, about their dreams. And then the following year it was Old Spice. And then the following year it was Rebecca Black's horrible Friday, Friday video. And then last year we did the mashup of Call Me, if, of, you know, Call Me Maybe and Gangnam Style. So I'm just praying that something comes out better than Blurred Lines this year. <laughs> So um, there's, uh, uh, we, we touched upon uh, first round being itself a startup, funding other startups, uh, and um, I, I put Funders Club in that camp as well. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned at the margins of sort of epic successes, epic failures. I, it'd be, if you're willing to, it'd be super interesting, I think, to hear a little anecdotes about uh, what you consider to be your, to date, your most spectacular failure. Uh, and then conversely, your, your most you know, spectacular success, and then maybe perhaps the, the most gratifying um, thing as well in, in, uh, in your experience as an investor. So I was user number 247 on Twitter. Um, 
we were an investor in a company called Odeo, which was started by Ev uh, um, to build a podcasting service. We, we, we participated in the seed round, raised a large round. Quickly, shortly afterwards, Apple launched its podcasting feature and, and like we realized there was no business for an independent podcasting aggregator. And Ev did an amazing thing. He had made money. He'd previously started a company, Blogger, which he'd sold to Google. He kind of said, I don't want to harm my investors, so I'm going to, you know, I probably spent through a million of the dollars. I'm going to personally just make everyone whole. Um, and he bought everyone back. I'm like, that was pretty cool, right? Like a company doesn't work, you know, the founder's going to write you back. He was working on this thing called Twitter, TWTTR. He couldn't afford the domain with the vowels. And it was like, you know, I played around with it. I said, it's cool. And we offered him a term sheet for that. So we, if you talk to Ev, he'll tell you that, Ever Jack will tell you that we, you know, we sat down, offered them their first term sheet, uh, $500,000 at a $5 million pre. And, keep, you know, and then he kind of said, you know, I'm going to continue to fund it myself for a couple of months. I don't know where this is going to go. This was well before South by Southwest, well before all that stuff. So um, three months later, get a phone call saying, yeah, you know, we're going to raise money. Fred at Union Square is leading around, but it's like at a $20 million price. And this is early in our history, but it was like 4x the price we just offered him three months ago. The highest price we had ever paid um, for a company before ever was $10 million pre. Um, so it's like 2x the highest price, 4x the price we offered, and there's no traction yet. Best of luck. You know, we could have participated 500,000 in that round. So like most spectacular failure, I'd probably say, you know, I have the email pinned over my desk saying, thanks, but no thanks, that I, where I wrote that to him. Now, I would say that led to one of, one of our most spectacular successes, which is when we heard that Jack was starting Square. You know, called him up and said, dude, you got to give me a chance to, like, redeem myself. Um, so we went out to dinner, and he kind of said, well, if you thought that one was going to be expensive, <laughs> that, <if> you, thought, <laughs> you know, the price was, like, 2x. That then, no problem, we're in. Slid the check across the table. And you know, I'd say our investment in Square led to, to you know, is, is, is a spectacular success. So I you know, clearly learned a lesson there. What do you think about, uh, about valuations uh, for, you know, because you see in that, that's an example right there, a, a credible founder uh, with an idea, but at an ex expensive price, and, and yet you, you go in on, on the merit of something so I think that, look, when you look at 99% of most outcomes, valuations matter, right? So, so if you were to purely play the odds, valuations really matter. The difference between a 4 million pre and a 12 million pre means you're giving up two times your upside the day you write the check, right? You, you, you're, you're, you're just handing someone 66% of, you know, you know sorry, two, you know, 2x your profits, pretty much. Uh, instead of owning 6% you know, of the company, you're going to own 2% of the company. Um, so valuations, we believe that valuations matter, and we've walked from companies over valuations. That said, if, if, you know, if companies get to billion dollar plus outcomes, being part of that matters also, right? You know, I'd rather have 2% of a billion dollar out, you know, come than 0% of that out billion out dollar out outcome. Out. So, so, you know, but, but if you look at the vast majority of all exits, well, the vast majority of all companies fail. Those that exit are under 100, 50, 100 million almost all of them are under 150, and valuation really does matter, right? It's the difference between, if a company exits for 150 million, it could be the difference between you getting $3 million or $10 million back. Um, so I'm not gonna go on the record and say valuations don't matter, but there are times where we think the prudent thing to do is to be valuation sensitive. Sure, sure, okay. Uh, I think maybe we could go to questions uh, if, uh, if we're ready. Um, so, sure. Okay. Good, how are you? Uh, question about, uh, I know the initial thesis for your, uh, I know you, sorry, uh, I know the initial thesis for your uh, investment uh, in any entrepreneur uh, is, uh, is team, but uh, as I understand it, you, you led the round for Founders Club, is that right? Okay. Uh, setting aside the fact that Alex and Boris are great founders, uh, I'm curious about if you could share your thesis in the investment you made and how you think of uh, equity crowdfunding progressing. Sure. So, and also in the context of something you uh, said earlier about the 
the, f the influx of seed capital uh, and how competitive it is to get into great deals these days and kind of the value proposition of funds like these competing in that marketplace. So I think what attracted us first was the team, the team that, you know, I'd known Boris for a while, gotten to know Alex, and saw them as strong operators. I thought, also thought they had a really novel idea, which is that when you look at an asset class, why should there be an artificial constraint as the size of the check? It's, it's an artifact of, of, of a regulatory framework that's sort of no longer relevant and no longer valid, right? So, so why can I buy $500 worth of Apple stock, but I have to buy, write a $50,000 or $100,000 check in this other company? And, and I personally believe that um, many angels have lost their money by, through lack of diversification. Um, and and if, you know, when I talk to any angel, I, I, I stress the importance of diversification, right? Um, because if I look at the angel investments I made, I made 40 angel investments with my own capital before I set up the fund. And if I looked at my conviction level at the time I wrote the check, you know, I'm not sure that I would have written the check into LinkedIn. Like, I might not have written that check. And that would have been, a, you know, another spectacular failure if I hadn't have done that. And, and so diversification is important. So when I saw a platform that could offer that level of diversification with strong founders and also offer a benefit to the company, which is sort of not having to corral and communicate and deal with a number of angel investors, not having to sort of chase them down for signatures, but having the ability to maybe extract some of that value from them, it seemed like a really strong thing. You know, crowdfunding in general, and I wouldn't call Funders Club crowdfunding, but you know, it's more of an online VC model. But, but, but crowdfunding in general is, I think, transformational, especially for some of those companies that historically haven't been able to raise money uh, or have had a hard time raising money. Hardware-based businesses, for example, really hard time raising money. Um, we passed on a company called Ouya that came in and pitched us. And we said, who would want to buy an Android-based video game console? They put it on Kickstarter. It was the most successful Kickstarter-based hardware project ever. Went on to raise eight to 10, mil sell eight to 10 million dollars of pre-orders before they ever manufactured a thing. And you know, we found Smart Things, a, a company that's focused on the Internet of Things, on Kickstarter through their success there. So these type of things can also provide really good signal for entrepreneurs. So I think it's a force. I think it's here to stay. I think that to some degree, the, the industry is laid out. Look, our school calendar is based on the agrarian farming base. Like that, you know, it was set up because of like, people that were farming. And like, you look at it now and say, like, if you were magic wand, if you were going to sort of build a school, sy school system, it wouldn't be based on farmers. And, and, and I think our angel investing infrastructure is based on a regulatory framework that is evolving. And I, what I think is actually happening now is that you're seeing people actually say, you know, should it be based on this? If you had a magic wand, what could it be based on? What, is the, what makes the most sense? for the entrepreneur? What makes the most sense for the investor? What provides the greatest level of diversification? And I think that's the transformation we're going through right now. And I think it's a healthy thing and a good thing. Uh, any other questions for Josh? So it can be really intimidating as a startup founder to come to these conferences and listen to everybody who's looking for the next Dropbox or Airbnb um, because uh, the, the idea of walking into a room and saying, don't worry, I have the next billion dollar idea um, is, uh, is actually pretty much ridiculous if you look at how many billion dollar companies there are versus how many hundred million dollar companies there are. Um, what is your appetite for um, interest in or um, how do you react to founders who are saying if if this goes to a billion dollars it isn't because I see a path there now I see a path to 150 million and if we get all the green lights it could be a billion what do you say to them and are you even interested in talking to those kinds of founders so a few things first I think that there's a lot of false precision in this industry I look back at the level of conviction I had that this company would never get bigger than this or this would get, you know, and you could speak with confidence and clarity as to how big a company and an exit's gonna be. And the real answer is like, it's bullshit, you don't know. Like look at Groupon, right? They went from $2 billion, they turned down a $6 billion offer three months later, they went out and raised money at $10 billion, 
They were rumored to IPO at $20 billion, and then they traded down to five, all within nine months. Right? So it went from two to 20 to five, and that's a company that's mature. That's a company that's doing hundreds of millions of revenue. So if the market can't accurately predict what that company is worth, how, are you gonna, how can I really say what your PowerPoint is worth? Like, so, so the first thing I'm gonna say is, like, I think that there's a lot of false precision there. I would also say that I think that venture is oftentimes the wrong thing for founders. I worry that our ecosystem is so much driven towards venture. That, you, you know, that, that there's like this inertia, right? You raise your angel money, then you raise your venture money, then you do it. Like, but venture kind of oftentimes forces someone into an exit trajectory that's unhealthy. And I think that really is a competitive advantage for angels because an angel investor doesn't force them into that. And the reason why venture forces them into that is because of the venture math. $400 million fund, in order to get a 20% return, you have to return 1.2 billion. You own 20% of a company on exit, add in fee and carry, you gotta create seven and a half billion dollars worth of market value in order to hit your number, right? Because if you gotta return 1.2 and you add in fee and carry, it's 1.5, 20%. So what ends up happening is venture tends to look for the moonshot, whereas angel is perfectly fine with some of those, or, or seed funds oftentimes, because they're smaller, are perfectly fine with some of those different outcomes. The analogy I'd use is this, I'll finish with this. I'm, you know, when I take the train from Philly, where I live, to New York, I have the choice of two trains, the local or the express. Both take me to what's the same destination, Penn Station. When you're an entrepreneur and you raise money from a bulge bracket VC, like the large typical VC, their destination is that billion dollar outcome because that's what moves their needle. They need to get seven billion. They're not aiming for a 50 million or 100 million dollar outcome. Like, so you buy, you're buying a ticket on the express train to the billion dollar outcome. And the only way you get off if, like, if you get thrown off or if the train breaks down, but either way, it's not pretty. I think when you take money from an angel or a seed fund, oftentimes the destination should still be the same. Like you should invest because I think this could be a big company. I'm not, you know, um, but when the doors open in Trenton, Metro Park, Newark at the 25, 100 million, 200 million, $75 million stop along the way, you could look around and say like, hey, is there smoke on the train? Sh you know, should we get off? And, to, add, to add a and, data point to, to what Josh is saying, it's, it's worth everybody in the audience noting that uh, of the fastest growing private companies in America as recognized by Inc. Uh, in their annual list, uh, only one in five ever took venture capital. Uh, yep. so, it's, yeah. so I think that, that ain't one, of the, you know, one of the ways that angels and seed funds could compete, look, I don't invest buying a ticket to Trenton. Like, I don't invest buying a ticket to the $25 million stop. I have to think that there's the potential for it to go longer, but I'm far more aligned with the founder, given my fund size and given our investment returns with those earlier stops than the bulge bracket VC. And that's one, of the, that's one of the asymmetrical competitive advantages that angels have, which is sort of VCs force companies to adopt to the VC math to, 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 to try to, you know, a VC would rather, if, if there was a 90% chance of failure and a 10% chance of a billion dollar outcome, that's perfectly fine for a VC. Whereas if, if there, a founder said, you know what, if there's a 50% chance of a hundred million dollar outcome, and a 50% like that, like that, that, that calculus would never be allowed to happen in a, tip, in a typical VC round. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Josh. Some yeah. round of applause. My pleasure.